Okay. I think we're working. I think we're live. Are we live? I hope so. I'm going to give it a minute to see if I can uh, get this going. If you're here and uh, you can see me and hear me okay, just to throw a comment up if that works for you. Hopefully it's working. Uh, we'll see if this is going to be an option for us. Mm, let's see. I know this is a uh, captivating um, YouTube right now, but let's begin. If you're here, great. If you're not here live and you're watching this later, it's great. Um, we do the best that we can with what we have. And um, let's see what we got. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remembering now and always that we are in the presence of a good and loving God. And mindful of this reality, we'll pause and try to collect ourselves, uh, join together in prayer, mindfulness of uh, the goodness of God, the grace of God among us. We pray, Lord, for blessing, for healing, for an end to this uh, pandemic. We pray for the joyfulness to recognize the good things that you've done for our lives and the things that you continue to do in our lives. And so we offer all of this in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. St. Faustina. Pray for us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, Alex. I got one person here. That's great. I'm glad that you're here. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Acts chapter 23 and 24 today. Uh, this week, we are going to be finishing Acts of the Apostles. Um, your assignment for today is to read chapters 25 and 26. Tomorrow will be 27 and 28. And that'll be it. Um, hi, Gigi. Uh, I'm going to be announcing on Monday your final project. So next Monday, uh, your project uh, will be something to do with the scriptures, of course, um, and some written elements. There's not going to be a final exam this year because of the obvious reasons. You're all working from home, and the idea of kind of test feels kind of silly when you are working under different circumstances. So there will be a final project um, it's going to be a little bit involved, but hopefully not too overwhelming. But I'll give details for that uh, on Monday. But let's get into uh, Acts chapter 23 and 24 and make a couple quick comments. Uh, first things first, let's get a little context. Where do we leave off in Acts chapter 22 last week? So we're reading as we hear that all of the apostles are kind of gathered together at Pentecost. They're going to um, start their ministry, particularly St. Peter is going to be uh, the central figure. Him and John are preaching and teaching. They're arrested. They're let go. We have all, all of these um, stories of them kind of in the early chapters. And then once we get to the story of the conversion of uh, Paul, right? So he is a persecutor of the Christians. He is seeking to arrest them. And then he goes through this dramatic conversion experience. Um, in his, or Paul helped contribute some of it. Um, Paul, a number of you have come made comments and asked questions about why is he traveling so much? Why does he seem like he's always kind of on the road or moving to different cities? Well, of course, he's doing this because his mission is to, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, Gentiles meaning non-Jews. And so uh, his mission is to go out all the world. Um, and then means travel. It means being on the road. And so he's constantly traveling and he's constantly building up the church and making new disciples and bringing about new members into the church, but he's also making enemies and he's finding himself in a lot of trouble. And Acts chapter 23 is one of those occasions where we see where Paul is in trouble. And so he's um, in Jerusalem and he's brought on trial. Okay. And at Acts chapter 23, we kind of pick up that trial, that uh, that situation where Paul is going to be brought before the Sanhedrin. Now I've made comments about this before, but the Sanhedrin are the religious leadership. So that would include the, the, the priestly class, the high priests, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Now, who are the Pharisees and who are the Sadducees? Well, there's a lot to kind of try to unpack here, but perhaps think of it like this. Within the Jewish people in the first century, we see lots of different factions and lots of different groups and clusters within Judaism, right? And so there are different people, different members um, of the Jewish people who kind of fall into different groups. And this is because the Jewish people have for uh, generations have been in wars, have been battling, have been conquered, have been um, dispersed, have gone into exile, have returned from exile. And so within their own community, within their own kind of uh, 
the people of God, the covenant people of God, there's kind of these smaller groups of people who might have had different cultural influences, people who have had different theological understandings of the sacred scriptures, the Old Testament of the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, right? So particularly the law, uh, what Moses gave on Mount Sinai. And so there's different understandings of this. And so we have these different groups. Two of those groups would be the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now they would live out the faith in different ways. The Pharisees were more of the teaching class. So they would be the ones who would be in charge of giving a more or less religious instruction, if you will. Um, the Sadducees kind of just um, almost like think of them almost like a religious order, right? So they were very devout in their prayerfulness and their obedience to the law. So they were very kind of uh, faithful and literalistic to the law. So like not just the law, meaning the Ten Commandments, but the law, meaning all of the ritualistic laws, which there's over 600 of them. And so very kind of, they kind of take different approaches. And one of the major differences between the two of them is their positions, their theological position on the uh, resurrection of the body. Okay, now we understand as Christians, as followers of Christ, hey, Leo, followers of Christ, that the idea of the resurrection is kind of before Christ, the idea of a resurrection was kind of controversial. So uh, to simplify, the Pharisees believed that there would be a resurrection or some kind of version of the resurrection at the end of time or after death, or there'd be some kind of life after death. That was the Pharisees' position. The Sadducees' position was that death meant death. And so the of God meant what you do in this world by faithful obedience to the law, you will receive blessing from God. And so you can enjoy this life now by living in holiness and living in faithfulness to you now. Whereas the Pharisees uh, similarly believe that you should be obedient to the law and receive God's blessing now, but that there would be some kind of so anyway, long story short, the Jews were kind of divided about this in a theological manner. So there wasn't a clear teaching of was there definitely going to be some kind of resurrection or not. Now, go to Paul. So when we get to Acts chapter 23, we get to um, a situation where Paul is going to find himself on trial before the Sanhedrin. That means Pharisees and Sadducees, as well as other religious leadership were there. And they're asking questions about Paul. What are you doing? You're everything that we've known, right? That Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Savior. All these other things. So they're all kind of collectively upset. So uh, Paul kind of instigates the crowd a little bit here um, by giving his testimony. Now, there's some interesting words here. So let's look at Acts chapter 23, verse 3. So if you have it in front of you, you can follow along, but I'll read it. It says, um, uh, this is after the high priest uh, strikes at Paul's mouth. So he has him slapped in the face. Now, you can look at this in different ways. One is just a physical kind of act of violence. Number two kind of can be symbolic of you know, shut your mouth, right? So a slap in the mouth, kind of a be quiet. Um, and of course, Paul's not going to be quiet. He's already established this, that he's not afraid to preach the gospel, even if it means getting himself uh, beaten and imprisoned and whatever. Acts chapter 23, verse 3, it says, Then Paul said to him, meaning the high priest, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you indeed sit on judgment upon me according to the law, yet in violation of the law order me to be struck? Now, this is great. This idea of a whitewashed wall, I mean, yesterday, what does it mean, uh, a whitewashed wall? I think what Paul's saying here is that you are completely bland and vanilla. You are unwilling to take a stand and stand up for what is true and what is good here. So when you see a whitewashed wall, think of like, um, you know, if you were repainting in your house uh, and you just wanted to paint a wall as boring as possible, you would just paint it all white, right? There's no kind of, uh, statement there. There's no boldness there. There's no kind of conviction there. So the idea of someone being whitewashed wall means that you're just kind of calling them out for being uh, neutral on a position where they should take a stand, right? And so Paul's calling out the Sanhedrin and saying, you're a whitewashed wall. You're not standing up for what it is that God has revealed in the Old Testament, which I'm clearly teaching to you, and what Jesus Christ has revealed in his person in his own suffering, death, and resurrection. But rather, you're kind of taking this kind of boring position, this kind of unenlightened position, holding back from kind of actually committing to what actually might be the truth of what God has revealed. And so, um, so it's kind of a, a, an insult, a jab at the high priest here. 
Uh, and of course, then he calls them out that you sit on a place of judgment, right? So you're putting me on trial. You're judging me, but you yourselves are the ones violating the law because you're having me uh, uh, attacked and being assaulted, even though I'm an innocent man here, right? And so um, anyway, Paul, of course, is going to incite the crowd, but he's going to um, uh, talk about the... Um, the resurrection of the body. So he himself is a Pharisee or from the Pharisees class. He grew up as a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. And so he's going to me mention the resurrection and the resurrection that, um, of course, will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, that, of course, is going to cause a divide between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They start arguing among themselves. So they're kind of getting sidetracked with all of this chaos here. Um, the crowd is being stirred up here. And in this chaos, Paul's trying to uh, kind of remove himself a little bit. But we see something interesting in verse 12 here. I just want to highlight this quickly. Um, it says, when the day came for the Jews, uh, when the day came, they found themselves by an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were no more. There were more than 40 who formed this conspiracy. Okay, a couple of quick thoughts on this because a number of people brought this up. Why would they make an oath to avoid eating or drinking until they killed Paul? Well, one way to look at this is a very obvious literal manner. Right. And say that they literally were just going to not eat or drink until they killed him. Number two is to look at this as kind of a hyperbolic, symbolic statement. And maybe something to draw a comparison would be something that you have probably heard your parents say when we're in the classroom, which is like, um, you know, you're driving me crazy. My head is going to explode. Right. Or if I have to say this one more time, like my head is going to blow right off my shoulders. Right. That's not literally going to happen. But it conveys a certain drama that there's a lot of anger and hostility here. Now, perhaps they were actually going to fast and maybe they would. Um, I think it's unlikely that they kind of starved themselves to death because ultimately they wouldn't be killing Paul you know, here. So I, I'm doubtful that they actually starved themselves to death. But I think the greater thing is that they have a certain commitment to evil here. And this is something that we should be aware of because as we have to understand what it is that is happening in the early church. And number two, we understand how does this translate into our own lives as um, disciples of Jesus Christ today? And here's where I think it's important. As we go out into the world, or we try our best to live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, we're going to run into people who have a certain commitment to evil, a certain um, digging in of their heels to destroy the church, certain people who are going to make it their mission to attack and persecute followers of Jesus Christ. Because being a follower of Jesus today and you kind of quietly hide and pray, it means the way you live your life is dramatically different from the rest of the world. Okay. And so that means that there's a certain obligation for you and for me to, right? As Christians, if we don't stand out in the world as being different, meaning that we have a certain kind of joyfulness, a certain kind of hopefulness, a certain kind of love of neighbor and service towards others, a certain kind of desire for um, thoughtful engagement with the truth, um, then we're failing to live up to this. And so when there's people who oppose this, they're going to have a certain commitment to destroying us. So be aware of that. We're running low on time and I don't want to spend uh, forever on this. And I'm thankful if you're still hanging out on the live feed here. Um, Acts chapter 23 ends with St. Paul, who's going to be transferred. Now, Paul is kind of a creative person. He's a smart person. He knows that he is also a Roman citizen and that it, at the time it would be against the law for the Jews to kill a Roman citizen without that citizen going on trial before the Roman authorities. So Paul brings this up to one of the guards. The guard relays the message to his superior. Eventually, Paul's going to find himself transferred to another city, to Caesarea, right, under protection. Now, it's not that the Romans really liked Paul and they wanted to protect him, but they were someone who, uh, they were people who were very strict about their own laws. And so their laws and their minds superseded the Jewish laws. And so whatever the Jews were upset about, whatever the Sanhedrin was upset about, they needed to kind of go to the side and chill out while the Romans dealt with this. So Paul is transferred He's put on trial at Caesarea before the, the Roman leadership there. And so different things happen there. But in verse 11 through 16, just a quick comment here. Um, we're going to hear about Paul very quickly, and I'll end with this. He says, uh, and this is talking to the, uh, to the judge there, the Roman leadership. He says, as you can verify, not more than 12 days have passed since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Neither in the temple nor in the synagogues 
nor anywhere in the city did they find me arguing with anyone or instigating a riot among the people, nor can they prove to you the accusations that are now making against me. So Paul's quick thoughts here are, listen, you got no evidence. You can't prove it. He's very rational. He's very calm, right? He's not emotional here. He's making a very sound case. Then in verse 14 says, but I do, but this I do admit to you that according to the way, right? By the way, we're talking about the church, but, um, <clears throat> oh, I lost my spot here. Uh, according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our ancestors. And I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. I have the same hope in God as they themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of the righteous and their unrighteous. Because of this, I always strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Right. So Paul is distinguishing himself from the people who want to kill him, saying they got no evidence. I'm an innocent man. I haven't provoked anyone. But at the back and saying, you know what? I'm also with them. These are my people. This is how I also believe in worship. I worship the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of the prophets. Right. Who is fulfilled in Jesus. The problem is that the Jews are kind of ending with the prophets and they're not kind of continuing with the next uh, chapter in God's story here, which of course is the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Okay. That's a lot for today. Um, we're going to end. I'm glad that you're here. Hopefully this worked out. I hope the connection worked. If it was something good and you want to continue doing this, if you prefer to do it live feed, uh, throw a comment up here or on the Google classroom. And that's good. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Tomorrow we have uh, your zoom option. So you can join with zoom. Um, the details will be posted tomorrow morning. You know the times uh, you're scheduled for. Or if you don't want to join the Zoom class, that's fine too. You can um, uh, do the other posts. I'll put up an audio clip for you to kind of look at for tomorrow. All right, everybody. Enjoy your day, huh?